the screen. So the exact location will depend on what kind of device you're using. There are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with fellow attendees. But if you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program, so please make sure you're putting them there and not in the chat. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Stray, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations, 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. every day of the week, and you can purchase Stephanie's book and many others on site. Or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I put the buy link in the chat um, and I will put it in again shortly. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewers tonight are Emma Roberts and Kara Price. Emma is an actress based in Los Angeles and Kara is an experienced content producer and writer based in New York City. Together, they are the co-founders of Bellatrist, a social media first com a community for book lovers. Through Bellatrist, Kara and Emma are on a mission to promote reading as an accessible and unique form of self-care. Most recently, Emma and Kara developed Bellatrist Productions, a film TV uh, production arm focused on adapting literary IP for film and TV. They currently have projects set up at Netflix, Hulu, FX, and HBO Max. They will be speaking with our featured author, Stephanie Dandler. She's a novelist, memoirist, and screenwriter. She's the author of Stray and the international bestseller Sweet Bitter, and is also the creator and executive producer of the Sweet Bitter series on Stars. Her work has appeared in the Sewanee Review, Vogue, the New York Times Book Review, and the Paris Review Daily. Her nonfiction received an honorable mention in Best American Essays 2018, and her criticism won the 2019 Robert B. Heilman Award from the Sewanee Review. She is based in Los Angeles, California. Her memoir, Stray, is a moving, sometimes devastating, brilliantly written and ultimately inspiring exploration of the landscapes of damage and survival. The book has been praised by the likes of Jamie Lee Curtis, Danny Shapiro, and Lisa Tadeo, who says, in Stray, Stephanie Danler has created a compulsive, neck-breaking masterpiece. It is pleasurable and full-throatedly sensual beyond words. The abounding pain is unsentimentally rendered, but mind-blowingly felt. It's a dark and hot book, a violently provocative one, but it is also quiet and tender. Ultimately, this is a kind writer and on every page there is hope. Stephanie will be talking with Emma and Kara and then afterwards with all of you. Please take it away, Stephanie, Emma, and Kara. Hello, everybody. Hi, everybody in the oh. chat. Hi, Emma. Hi, Hi Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, my favorite people. I was just saying before we started, this was an excuse to spend more time with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just sitting here in awe listening to her list off all of your all of your accomplishments and accolades. Oh my goodness. Um, we're so ex I'm so excited to talk to you about this book. I mean, I feel like I've been on the edge of my seat ready to talk about this since before even the um, it came out because I read I read the galley which I just wanted to show everyone because it's so special to it's me. not even a galley let's be real that's a that's a bound manuscript it's a bound manuscript it is. I didn't wait to read it and so I literally got this and I and I wrote when I read it and it's underlined and um, I cherish it so anyways this is uh, I'm gonna get my much nicer paperback copy now that it's out um, but we we love this book and we love you and we're so excited to talk about it I am so grateful. Um, Emma, I was thinking about you when I was writing the book because that was when I met you, when I was living in Laurel Canyon in that crazy shack. And I remember one day you had dropped me off there and it was like perched up on a hillside. And were you also, you were also living in Laurel Canyon at the time. I was living in Laurel Canyon. And I remember we were in like gridlock traffic as you are on Laurel Canyon. And I dropped you off. And I remember just like, I was such a fan obviously of you and like a sweet bitter, which was my favorite book. And like, I couldn't believe that I got to drop you off in Laurel Canyon and like it just felt like such a magical cool moment and I didn't even make the connection that you were writing this in retrospect. Well, I really wasn't I mean that is actually a great place to start I really wasn't I was working on a second book that I thought was a novel that was like a good idea but not ever going to happen, but I hadn't come to that realization yet. But it was right around the time that I had published that piece for Vogue about my father's, well, it was right after actually, because I remember you and I talking about that, um, about my father's crystal meth addiction. 
So this was just very, very early days. But what you didn't know, and I don't know if we talked about it, was that I was dating a married man and losing my mind. <laughs> and the- well, now a very good. Things are making sense now in retrospect yeah. as they do, which I don't need to tell tell you that in having written Stray and for anyone that's read it where, you know, things definitely seem different in retrospect. Um, but that's what I was going to ask you to kind of start with is like, you know, did you, well, you answered that, but you didn't sit down intending to write a memoir, I, I take it. And I guess like, when did you realize that you were going to write this memoir and this is what it was going to be and, it, and you were going to fully commit to like, you know, really revealing such revealing parts of your life? Um, so I wrote that essay for Vogue and I thought it was a one-off. Um, I was really proud of it and really honored by the response. I had it on my bulletin board, pinned on my bulletin board because I loved it so much. I just have to say that. It was so, I tried to pull it twice and I, you know, at the time I was like, my dad, like, I can't handle this conference. This is like a passive, the ultimate passive aggressive conversation is not having contact with someone and then writing a book about them or (laughs) writing an article and just be like, here, send. Um, It actually feels kind of bullying in a way because whoever controls the pen like has all of the power. Um, But from that point on, I was taking notes on something that was personal. And I thought that it was just like kind of from being back in California, like, oh, these memories are haunting me. They're sticking around. This all feels so tender and important. And I don't know why yet. And then I pitched Adam Ross at the Swanee Review an essay. And that essay was about the destruction of the Owens Valley which basically we stole all of a short story is we stole all of the water to build Los Angeles from Owens Valley and we turned it into a carcinogenic dust bowl. I highly recommend everyone look this up. It's fascinating. Um, It's in the background of the movie Chinatown as well. Like this was a crisis because the city that we're in, Emma and I are in, has no natural water. And so I thought I was going to write this environmental piece and it was going to be slightly more journalistic than anything I'd done before. And I got going on it and it was about my father. Like the whole piece was about my father and like sites of trauma and growing up here and the lies that we need to tell ourselves in order to live in unsafe places. And then I knew, I was like, oh, this is all connected. This is a book. Coming back to California is connected to letting go of these people who um, I loved so deeply and who ultimately really hurt me for better or for worse. So that was when I knew there was like the metaphor would hold that the California piece could connect back to the personal. Well, I, I mean, I loved having grown up in LA and have my own kind of, you know, haunts of of just the way everyone does with where you grew up. I just, I loved the way you described LA and, and kind of the metaphors tied in, in with it. I really related to, and I just, I loved it so much. I think, oh, no, 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 you go. please jump in. Uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Zoom, this is, by the way, I would just like to point out, this is like the, the Zoom dance of like, yeah. <laughs> Marx Brothers, you yeah. Um, I think that we see one side of Los Angeles so often and one that both of you are really familiar with this sort of like gilded glamorous surface of privilege and ease and Los Angeles is actually full of crazy people from all walks of life and it really is a city and there's, you know, there's the Laurel Canyon of it all, but there's also the Salton Sea of it all, which isn't Los Angeles, but like weirdos come here, con men, dreamers, like scam artists of all shapes and sizes. And I love that about this city. Mm-hmm. Um, but so often in the media, you're really, you're just looking at the, the sort of um, whatever's glossiest, mm-hmm. whatever. Lifestyles of the rich and famous Robin Leach kind of thing. Totally. <laughs> Where did that show go? <laughs> I, it will probably be rebooted. Um, I, I, well, I was thinking when you were talking about um, like the kind of how writing is, a, it seems to me from reading your work, like 
all different kinds of your work, whether it be memoir or novel or, or some of your more journalistic pieces that like writing is really a form of survival that's twofold. Like one, like financial survival, obviously, which is very important. And I think kind of um, overlooked, especially like when women talk about writing, because it seems, because I think for a lot of people, it's unimaginable that you could make money writing. <laughs> um, and then also like the survival of like your sort of personhood and like being able to live. And I, I, I guess my question for you is like, when did you know that you wanted to write for both reasons? Um, and like, I don't know, like, yeah. When did you know that writing was a survival instinct for you? That's such a great question. And I love, I mean, I hate talking about money, but I love to, because it's so taboo. Um, so I think writing as a coping mechanism starts so young with a lot of us, the same way that reading as a coping mechanism goes. Like most of us who grew up loving to read were avoiding something. Not all of us, I'm not, I, there are plenty of happy people, happy childhood readers. I don't know them, but um, most of us were escaping into this world. And some of us, are writing also to express ourselves and make sense of the world, right? Like, I can't trust the adults here. Everything feels unsafe. Like, I don't know who I am. And writing is a way of making sense of that. And so that sort of cathartic impulse we tend to disregard as we get older. And we're like, oh, it's adolescent, juvenile, navel gazing, feminine, whatever. This sort of like writing to know myself but that is still at the heart of everything that I do. And most people I know it is at the heart, even men who, you know, can are fluent in lit theory. <laughs> they want to know themselves. They want to make sense of the world. They want to know if there's God, they want to know how language works. Like they want to know why we fail the people that we love. Like there are really sincere and sentimental impulses there that people try to pretend like, oh, I was crafting like an allegory about the American dream. Like, <laughs> no, you're just like, you're curious about your heart. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay that you have one. Um, and so that came first. And when I went back to graduate school, I went into a ton of personal debt and I was really scared and I still think that's really stupid. So like anyone out there that is listening to this, like it's stupid, um, try to find funded programs. It's so scary. And the return on being a writer, I realize as I'm saying this, I've been able to make a life out of this, but I'm telling you the majority of the time, the return on being a writer is not there. And so I really, when I took out that loan, I take money so seriously because I've been financially on my own for most of my life and like most of us, but I loved that I was accountable to that debt, if that makes sense. Like when I was in graduate school, I was like some people maybe whose parents were paying for their tuition, they're like, I'm going to try a short story that's like Cormac McCarthy this week. And I'm going to write The Hunger Games this week. And I was like, I need to finish a fucking novel immediately to sell it. Like I have to have something that balances the weight of this debt. And so I finished the novel in two years. And it, so it was very financially motivated, even though I knew statistically there was no hope that I was going to literally pay back that debt emotionally i knew that i would be have paid it back if i could sell a book and what happened with sweet bitter was crazy and life-changing and also at the same time i tell people this just because there's so much it's so opaque um the money's parceled out like i just finished getting paid for that original deal because stray published paperback it's been six years and so while it was life-changing, it was definitely not like, fuck you money. Like I'm out <laughs> on a yacht. Like I'll just be here reading Edith Wharton if you need me. <laughs> like 
I had to write articles. I had to try, I wanted to try to turn my book into a show. It's a grind. Like I wrote travel articles. I wrote essays for Vogue. I wrote pieces for this. I, I was traveling and bought a travel magazine and I saw, and it was like by Stephanie Dandler. And, and I was like, <gasps> And it was about, you had written this like amazing article about, um, where did you go? Was it Spain? Where did you go? I've done P. You're like, you're like, take (laughs) it. I did did Peru. I did Sicily. I loved it. What I love about you though, is you're like, you finish something and it has a great amount of success and you're like, okay, what's next? And that's something that I love about you. Cause I feel like I'm like that too, where the second that I am finished with something, I'm on to the next. And then when like people really like something I did, I'm like, that was so long ago. I'm like, I'm on to this thing. But, you know, it takes a while for things to really like you work on something so much longer than when it comes out and when it's successful. And I think people forget about that with writers and, and actors and stuff where it's like, we've been working on this for years or we put it down for a year and then it comes out and people think it's this new thing, but it's been like, you know, with us for so much longer, which I think is so interesting. Well, creatively and financially, you have really moved on at that point. You're, and I think as far as like personality quirks go, I think if you grew up in a kind of unstable environment or where you didn't exactly know what money meant, you're never going to, you're never going to get a check and just be like, I can retire now. It's like, and especially in a creative industry, it's too, it's too unsteady. It's so scary. And I've always kept a kind of day job, you know, and I consider that screenwriting now, which is like the best day job possible, but teaching is also an incredible day job and writing ad copy is also a day job and waiting tables is also a day job. Like, I think that it's been important to me at this stage, at this stage, I don't want to write books for money unless I really have to, right? I would rather be have my income come from something else because it's tricky. Yeah. Um, I I wanted to ask uh, I wanted to ask a question that because obviously you know Stray talks so much about family and family dynamics and parents and you know I think everybody has you know whether it's good or bad relationships with, with parents and children are complicated. And I feel like there's, there's like a moment in most people's lives, especially if they have parents that are like not conventional parents, which I know you didn't have, I didn't have, Kara didn't have. Um, and so like, I was wondering, it, was there a moment where you were like, my parents aren't like everybody else's parents? Like, can you, can you remember that? Or like when you kind of became aware of, you know, not only just like, what made them different, but, you know, the, the addiction of it all and, and all of that kinds of stuff, you know, like, when did you realize, oh, everybody's parents weren't like that? Cause I know I definitely like, you know, had that moment of like, oh, I guess my parents are kind of like quirky and different. And like our household is definitely not like uh, the conventional house. (laughs) Yeah. Um, you're like therapizing me in public, but I love it. But (laughs) uh, like everyone has this, has this moment. It's that moment of like realizing like your parents are people, I should say, and not like these two, you know, because you look at your parents and you're like, oh, they're my parents. Like they don't have feelings. They don't have a life. Like I'm their life. Like, you know, and then you realize, oh no, like they, of course they have a life. And of course they have an inner life. And of course they have so many things going on that don't revolve around me. I mean, I was, I was in my like twenties when I saw my mom as like a real person and not just like as my mom. And that was like kind of scary. Um, you know, well, I bet as, as a new mother, you're seeing as, it even more intensely right now. So much, so yeah. much. more. How did she do it? I'm like, my mom, you, whoever has read the book, I'm like, my mom is not capable of anything. She's not like tough. She, you know, has struggled her whole life. She had two babies, 21 months apart, and then was a single mother by the time I was three. Like, what the fuck? I just don't understand. how. I, I don't understand. I, I mean, my mom also raised me by herself from when I was seven till I was like 13. And you know, I mean, sorry, since I was seven till I was two, yeah. to, <laughs> since I was two from when I was two to 13. Um, 
I don't know why seven's been coming up for me lately, but that's another story. Um, but it's just so interesting because now having a four month old and my mom's been with me like the since the, pan the pandemic happened and I was pregnant, she like came out and has just been kind of like living with me and my boyfriend and now our baby. And she like helps us with everything. And I just literally like hold my son and I like cry to her and I'm like, I'm sorry if I was ever mean to you. Like you're the best mom, you're the best grandma. Cause I don't know how she does it. It's just like so overwhelming. And now I think about like my son and I'm like to him, I'm just going to be his mom. And like, I wonder, you know, when he's going to be old enough to be like, so tell me about your life before me. Cause there was definitely a huge, you know, life before him. But anyways, I'm rambling. I want to no, hear. <laughs> I know. I think um, I have gone. So this actually, it connects back to the book because I had just had Julian when I started writing this book and like there was some, Julian was four months. I'd been crafting it like pieces. I don't want to pretend like I wrote it that quickly, but when I like was really focused on getting a draft turned in, I had started when he was like four and a half months old and I wanted to know my parents and they're not, um, they're not, they're here, they're alive, but they're not here. My mom is disabled. We, I can't ask her like, did you have trouble breastfeeding? Like, how long was I breastfed? What was your labor like? And my dad was just not around. And it's, I wanted to feel close to them in a way or know them or imagine that they had a life beyond me. So that like same, I do think that like, your mother wound is on display when you have a baby, all the mom stuff. But um, to answer your original question, I wrote about it in the book, actually. I, I had been practicing calling 911 and I got in, I was like five or six years old. I was in kindergarten and it was because my mom would fall and I was really scared and I remember the teachers talking to me about it and the like general concern. Like I went to a Catholic school and the principal nun was involved and my teacher who was a nun and they were, you know, they're trying to, now looking back on it, I just thought I was in trouble. I was like, I called 911 like multiple times. Everyone knows, everyone at school knows I'm in big trouble. And now looking back on it, they're trying to find out if something was wrong because that's not normal behavior for a five or six year old. I know five and six year olds now. And if they had the wherewithal to be like, I need outside help for an emergency, I would be like, what's going on in your house? Mm -hmm. Like something is not quite right. Um, but at the time I was just like, Oh, I'm precocious. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, someone else used to call 911 too. Well, I think I just, I was just thinking as you were saying that, um, and I thought of this when I was reading straight for the first, I, mean, I think I read straight. Yeah. I read straight twice, maybe two, two and a half, like in the sense of, you know, a half time being like, oh, I was looking through it. Um, but, uh, I was thinking about this thing that happens like when we re recreate family systems, like we have our first family system and then we recreate them like either in relationships or friendships and that like you can think that something is very normal up until you know that it's that it's not and it's kind of incredible like the limits that like how far our limits can be stretched for normalcy when our reference points are really bad like mm -hmm. if you only know really bad like systems then you'll be in bad systems and not be able to recognize them and i think that's something that is kind of really interesting that comes out of the book of like, it's not necessarily like coincidence that you end up in a, a situation with the monster. Like they're not disconnected, right? From like a, a system where like, that is broken when you're young, I guess. And, and but it's, it's always just amazing to me, like how, how we pass judgment on people when we don't understand that like, this is the system that they know and therefore like are not self-critical in that system. They're just like, this is my fucking life, you know? And, and it's really sad when you think about it for a very small child. That's not a question. I was just- No, and that was like profound though. And whoever is watching this should rewind her later and just like write that note to yourself. <laughs> um, but I, 
I think that the mon the one to one of the relationship I was in with the monster being prepared for that. And if you haven't read the book, it's just that he is married and he is lying to me and he is disappearing constantly. And it's always this like abandonment and reunion and realizing that that was about my father was so shattering to me because I was already at the point when I was in love with this man, I was already at the point where I knew that my father was a bad guy. Like, Oh, you're not supposed to walk away from your family when you have two children under the age of three and, Oh, you've had a life, long drug problem and you chose drugs like all the stories had already been passed down to me and though the man I was in love with was not an addict he was building on this tolerance I had for totally aberrant behavior and literal disappearances right like phone turned off gone and reappearing again and expecting for his charm to kind of carry him through the situation. That is my father. But when you were just saying that, Kara, I was thinking about how, and it's something that I was beginning to grapple with during the time of Stray, but how my own substance abuse had always been in the context of really fucking serious alcoholics and not just my family, but in the restaurant industry. Like I was always so tame because I didn't black out because I never was late to work and I never called in sick. Um, you know, my nose never bled from doing cocaine or any of the like terrible things that I saw all the time. And yet I was always up against my own limit in a way that I think I could have gone to any Alcoholics Anonymous meeting in the world and bit they've been like, yeah, you have a problem. <laughs> um, but again, when your system is, reinforcing to you that like when it's within that context how do you know you're in your 20s you're like god i'm like i've really got my shit together because everyone else is falling apart and then you know 10 years later you're like huh that didn't, wasn't so good for me it's just <laughs> I wish everyone the fortune of the 10 years later. That's all I can say. <laughs> and then you and then you have a baby and you're like then you really know what it looks like hopefully to get your shit together. <laughs> or, um, I mean it's just a whole like new way of living your life and of looking at the world. Obviously. You know, I should say that like being having my lifestyle choices, we can, we're talking about a section of the book right now that's like dedicated to investigating my substance abuse. It's just heavy drinking, a lot of Xanax for those who haven't read the book. And I, I think getting pregnant was kind of like an easy pass to have just Xing that out of my life in a way that I'm actually not totally comfortable with because I've been pregnant or breastfeeding for over three years now. And I'm just like, what is my relationship? Like if my kids weren't in the picture, like have I gotten any better? Is anything different? And it will always be something. I just think I get, you get, especially when you first become a mom, you're just like, okay, I'm on the straight and narrow now, like doing mom shit, reading mom Literally. books. Like, and I Every think- Every night that, I'm like setting setting my my alarms for all hours of the of the. <laughs> insane early morning and like I, I I feel like I hit snooze the other day I went back to sleep and then I woke up and I was literally like <gasps> I was like like as though I had just like come out of the bottom of a lake and was like wait what needs to be done and it had only been 10 minutes but in my mind I was like just had a panic that like I had never felt before about anything Oh my God. That it's classic. If there are any mothers out there, when you like take that 10 minute nap and you actually have kind of forgotten about the baby, there's no, the panic that you feel when you wake up and you're like, there's a baby. I'm in charge of a baby. <laughs> like it is a fucking nightmare. But I do think, and I think a lot of women go through this where their childbearing years, they accept a certain like placidity or, and then just like, that part's over and oh all your old demons are there hi guys like welcome back like, I, think, We're still like, I think this is i think this is your next book <laughs> write it for oh, me <laughs> never again i was never thinking again. that though like i i've heard this like thing kind of or all, maybe i interpret it this way but like 
women just want to be done. Like I want to be done. Like I want to have a husband and, and I, you know, I'm never going to have a husband, but um, I, you know, I want to be done. I want to have, I want to finish because, and I'm like, well, what? And, and I get, I, I personally, I have that too, where it's like, I think what that means is like, I want to be done with my twenties ultimately, <laughs> but, but I think that like, there is a way. And when you were talking about your mom, I was thinking about this where it's like, I would imagine regardless of whether or not your mom is a writer and can express herself in the way that you do, like that the instinct to have a child is a very self-protecting instinct. Right. And it's like, you're like installing these guardrails. So like, even if her next 10 years were not the same kind of like reflection that you've had or, or like didn't instill those like guardrails that sometimes we all need to like get our shit together. It's still, I think, interesting to look at in terms of like, when everybody, when anybody chooses to have a child, it is like ultimately like self-preservation. Um, and you know, I, but, but, but the whole thing, like, I want to be done. I always think about is like, it's not a bad reason to have a kid. I want to be done is funny because I mean, I just, I don't, it's not even that I want to be done. It's like, I want to know when I'm going to be done. Like being <laughs> pregnant, I'm like, when am I going to be done? And I'm like, not like I'm enjoying it. I just want to know when it's going to be done. And like, you know, this phase, like, love it. When's it going to be like, I just like to know that's kind of, I think it's, I think, to, I mean, I, I'm answering Kara's question, but I think it's like a, just a control thing of like, okay, I need to do this for how long can I, and like, what's it going to take? You know, I think that's, I, I mean, I definitely feel that way, but that's just funny. Cause I'm always like, when, when am I going to be done? When is this going to be done? Just wondering, even with happy things too, by the way, I'm so like, when is this ending? <laughs> You already know that it's never going to be done <laughs> and that the newborn phase is replaced with like the crawling teething baby and the children are a great example of just like how much we are in flux. And I think that part of what I was dealing with it in strays, I was in my early thirties and I was like, I thought I was done. Like I got married young in my twenties. Like I, I thought I was done. I've made a good choice. This right, you got married marriage. young. I always forget that. You're first. And yeah. I left him at 29. I quit my job. I went back to graduate school. I had all this debt. I had no money anymore. And I was like, oh, I'm just starting. And then my son was born and I was like, oh shit, I'm just starting. And I kind of like, and we've talked about this at length at other times, but I am starting to resent this the idea that when you have a kid or when you hit four, like that you're ever done. Cause it's just, it's not true. It's yeah. you're never. Well, once something's done, done, once something's done, it's like something else is, star is starting. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, when I was like, oh, you know, after I had my son and I was like, oh, I'm, I don't have to be pregnant anymore. I'm not pregnant anymore. Like that phase is over. And then I'm like, oh, but now there's a baby here. <laughs> like, I'm like, you know what I mean? And so it's just like, it's just so, I feel like it's always like a juggling of like, okay, like I've gotten, I've gotten that thing down. I did that thing. And now here's the, the next thing. And it's, it's kind of, kind of wild. Um, I think this part, one of the reasons actually that I like didn't want to write a memoir is because I was like, it's not true that a story ends, right? Mm -hmm. And you're fixed, you get out of the hospital, you beat cancer, you get sober, you leave your husband, like it is so ongoing. And our stories, the way that we tell stories are always, we're always looking for the A to B journey. And it feels very false to how we're all living our lives. Well, that's why I love the way that you wrote Stray is because yeah, some memoirs, you know, it feels a little too where you're like, you know, it's like beginning and end. And I love that, like, I just felt like we were taken on this journey of this kind of like self-reflection that you were also going through in Stray. And that's like, I loved it so much because it's like, I felt like I was exploring it with you instead of you telling me like, like how it was or what to do. It was like, we, like I was there with you. And that's why I just loved, 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 loved reading this. And I could just, I could read it so many times and always find something different as well, um, depending on like where I'm at in my life. And so I look forward to revisiting it many times at different points. Um, there's you, a Rorschach in that way, like the good ones. Like you go and you, you can pick up a mem, you know, you can pick up someone's memoir and, depending on where you are in your life. 
you know, it's okay. kind of. Do you think you'll like, do you think you'll go back to this kind of, this kind of vibe, a memoir vibe for, for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that answer, but I feel like everyone else probably yeah. wants to know. It was, um, it was just unpleasant. Like was- talking to you guys is pleasant, but I don't, I don't know. I did not, I have not, I've yet to feel the promised catharsis of telling <laughs> the truth. Mm-hmm. Um, I mostly feel like I feel proud sometimes. I wrote another book, like what a fucking miracle to have written two yeah. books and uh, the being the only thing I've ever wanted to do my whole life mm-hmm. and I'm doing it. So that's, that's, I'm very proud of that. And I think that the writing's great. I like the way it's constructed, Emma, what you were just talking about. I'm very proud of because it's a tone choice of a way of including the reader and keeping this story kind of in flux as opposed to a concrete fact that already happened. I'm mostly like, to be perfectly honest, it's just like there's like this nagging shame about it. And it's not just because I'm embarrassed because I revealed things about me. Like, I really don't have a lot of shame about being a mistress or taking drugs or being reckless. Like I, I don't, it's more like, I feel shame sometimes. This is going to be a downer. So I'm sorry to everyone listening. I've never heard a memoir writer say this. Uh, They're always like, you tell your truth and you will be the most empowered version of yourself. Um, (laughs) I feel like I, I regret, I don't regret it, but I wish that these weren't the stories that I told about my parents because I I, think I understand that though. I mean, that's yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, please. No, I was just saying like, you know, I feel like, you know, like for me, even I think about like, Oh, if if I want to like write things that are personal and like a lot of the things that a lot, a lot of the thoughts that stop me are like, you know, what would my mom think if she read that? Or like, what would, and, and that, and it really does affect me where I'm just like, I don't know if I could share X, Y, or Z because of, you know, my my parents or what if they saw that or what, if that, so, I mean, that's one of the things that I like felt so inspired by though, when I read it is that you were very like honest about, about your parents. And I think that it's, it's, it's refreshing that you know, you weren't like, and then we all live happily ever after. And, you know, this is my truth and I'm the happiest person ever. Like, I like that, that it's, that you're like, you know, honest about it. And it's still, it's like still complicated. Like at the ending, you know, it's, it, it's kind of left, like you just kind of said what you needed to say, but I, that's why I loved that. And I think that that's something to be really proud of, but I understand how that could be frightening at times. Yeah. When people ask about memoir writing, I'm like, if your mom is living with you and taking care of your baby, like, now's not the time yeah. <laughs> to write a memoir. Um, but you yeah, do, these people you are- feel like you're like, I'm just curious. That's such an interesting thing to say. Like, you feel like, oh, maybe I, didn't, I wish I didn't say that about my parents. So no, because it's true and it, like at a certain point in writing this book, like the writer in me took over and she's like a ruthless animal and doesn't care about anyone's feelings, including mine. (laughs) But I I wish, you know, I look back and my grandmother is in the book for a split second and she was an alcoholic and abusive to my mother, to me. And she died when I was 16. And she shows up in the book as kind of the symbol of my um, my maternal lines damage, but she's such a rich person, like right. she's an incredible woman. And she had this crazy life growing up in Hollywood and auditioning against Elizabeth Taylor and like riding horses and just, um, and that's just, she had her own story Mm -hmm. and that I look back and I'm like, this is such a cruel art for someone to tell their story and for all the things that I have to leave out. And the same, the same is true of my mother. Like she's really complicated. She was not a great 
mother to me. She was also a single mother with, as I was just saying, like, I didn't get to paint people as fully. And sometimes I'm like, that's it. Like, but um, that is it. Cause I'm not writing another one. So <laughs> that's all. No, so, someone oh, said wait. something that I thought was really true, but I'm yeah. missing. I want you to ask your, the, the, the question. That's my favorite question about the title. Oh, okay. Okay. But I just want, okay. But someone, Vera said, I love that both can be true. You can be proud of the book and you can have complicated feelings about sharing it. Thank you for oh, saying that. that. Thank you, Vera. Um, oh, oh, oh yeah. I wanted to ask you and then, and then I want to go to questions because yeah, but I just, I love this question. It's, it's not a long, it's not a long e. So, so I, the title is stray. So a stray is a, can be a, a noun or a verb. Um, and which I'm, sh I mean, as, and I said this in my question, I said, and I'm sure you thought about it because you think about <laughs> she it. did write that in her question. Um, which uh, what, 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 what gives about that? What, what is it to you both? Oh, man, clever. This is writing. I, <laughs> we love the title being a verb and a noun. And I was, I was like, it's definitely both, but is there, is there one that it's more? Uh, no, equal, right? <laughs> it's like, it's about, you know, I say in the book, I was born astray. And what that means to me is that my life has come to fruition from the kindness of strangers and from this sort of like cobbling together a makeshift family wherever I go, right, of other strays. Um, and then I also, you know, maybe I, to answer, to play with your question, it's probably <laughs> more that because to stray is infidelity on the one hand, but it's also to stray from a path. Mm -hmm. And I Just did not write in this, this was not the book about the dissolution of my marriage or the end of my twenties, but I was in this limbo after having stray, stray is about the limbo of when you're off the path and you're like, am I ever going to get back on it. Like I, um, I, I think it, it's hard to remember now, but I try to feel what, how scary it was because I, I think when people come to these, they're often at the precipice of making big choices in their life. And it was just like fucking terrifying to step, step off the track, which was promising me security and be like, oh, now that I've done this, I'm going to spin out just like my parents, because I am just like them. Mm. Um, so yeah. And I, I also like the title. I love it. Very clever. Right, is to leave, but it's also to join. A, oh, a, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, didn't, I never thought of that. I never thought of that. Um, really fast. I want you to say, cause I always, who, who did the cover art for your book? Cause I, I'm very focused on it and I think it's wonderful. Which one? Which on cover? Both. On both. Well, which so, one? I know they have different covers, but I guess who did, but who was it the same or different? Oh, well, no, photo, right? Knopf, Knopf and Vintage are, they have two different designers. So this one was Janet Hansen and she, Knopf is so. That's in the same vein as Sweet Bitter. So she must totally. So yeah. we use my sweet bitter font, mine now, you know, I've <laughs> forever. And then this um, is the artist Terry Lowenthal, and she does these um, photos of California called Psychscapes, and they are fucking incredible. And we begged her, begged and pleaded. Gorgeous. It's so good. It's so uh, good. Yeah. And Madeline Partner designed the rest of it. Um, I wish I had mine in front of me. I'm astray right now, so I don't have any of my collection. Yeah. Um, in hotel rooms is textbook stray. I know. Enjoying hotel rooms is textbook stray. Actually. Textbook. <laughs> like it. <laughs> okay, so I I want. There's so many questions blowing up right now, and I want to start. Yeah, let's do um, it. Okay. All right. I just, to these smart people. Oh, 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 this is a good one. This, this is right. This rolls right out of the, what we were just talking about. Uh, 
So Emily, uh, Emily Frank asked that she just, or she said she just inhaled straight for the second time. And she says, your style is so enchanting. She's an aspiring writer. And she's curious how you've dealt with friends and family reading unflattering descriptions about themselves and your work. Do you ever have to sacrifice relationships for your writing and how do you work through it? So definitely. Uh, so yes, you do have to sacrifice relationships for your writing. Um, Anne Lamont has this incredible, Lamont has this incredible quote that if people don't like the way they were portrayed, they should have behaved better. <laughs> um, and I, I, I forgot about that. Really believe that. <laughs> And so <laughs> in the case of the people that, but to be like totally fair, not just like, fuck it, you have to be, you have to sacrifice your relationships. Um, the, my mother, my father, and my ex, I don't even know how to call him a boyfriend, like this married dude, the ex married dude, um, we're all already out of my life. Like I keep my mother at a distance. My father and I are estranged. He and I broke up quite a long time ago. And so I gave it to my father and to the married man to read. Um, I was going to ask. That wasn't great. No, <laughs> that was bad. But, was you know, in the case of my father, <laughs> and I like, ha I don't know that he knows how to use the internet, but I like half wish he was listening. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, once a narcissist always a narcissist like That's he did co he commented on a photo of it on instagram and wrote almost famous because he thinks he's almost famous i don't know that he understands totally what he's almost famous for but i wish i was making this up anyway great question and um I think, and so then in the case of someone like my sister or Carly, who are in the book quite a bit, like, I'm much more careful there. And it's not just avoiding unflattering. Like, I think my sister and I have a really hard fight in the book, um, but it's, I want to be true to the situation. Like I want to, and so they got, early, for those, there are certain people I will change things for. And then there are certain people where like, I'm giving you a heads up, I'm publishing this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, you know, as my therapist says, stick <laughs> to, <laughs> stick to my language, my truth, my story, how I remember things, me, 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 because that's really all you can say to mm. people. Well, what, what I also, what I've always loved, like about what I loved when I was reading this about your writing, if I can speak still, um, <laughs> is you're, even when you say, let's say unflattering, but it's the truth, but unflattering things about that have happened, but they're true. You, it's not like you're trying to paint your part in it. Like the, you know, you were always doing the best thing in the world. And that's why I think like, you know, I just loved this memoir so much is that it, it feels like you're being, you're, it feels like you're being fair, like with the way that you speak of yourself and your part in, in things. And that's, that's why to me, I didn't even read it as like talking on, you know, in an unflattering way about other people, because to me, it just kind of was like, this is what happened. And this is like where we were all at. And yeah, it was not, you know, the best for anybody. And so, so I think that, um, I think that that is something to be proud of. <laughs> well, Emma's right for the aspiring memoir writers. It's like, you really have to be fair. And I think that if you're looking at it just from a craft perspective, being a victim is a very boring story. Like no one wants that. You want someone who is acting equally um, against their circumstances. And if someone is just being acted upon the whole time, that's not a story. So being fair would be my advice in that situation. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really good advice for a memoir. Right. Um, someone, ask the question well there was two questions about like tone and also like uh, organizing but jason asked well he said that stray has single-handedly saved his life as someone born into a dysfunctional home life it has been a form of hospitality for me which i thought was an interesting choice of word um i was curious how you were able to organize all of these traumatic and difficult moments into a synchronized book and outline your thoughts what was that like i want to know too no, um, that's a good question because 
with my novel, I wrote from beginning to end and kind of surprised myself along the way. And with Stray, I started to collect. First, I was doing that like sort of like personal impressionistic writing, just collecting stuff. But then I started to organize memories or, or scenes onto note cards. And then I started to see that once I settled on three sections, right? Mother, father, monster. Um, that is really opened it up because I would be like, oh, this episode in Laurel Canyon is really about my mother. And this when this drive across country is about my father and this scene at the Chateau Marmont belongs here. And so I think, you know, Nabokov famously wrote on note cards. A lot of writers use them. They're like, a tele to me, they were always a television trick. Um, and but they work. What you're putting on the note card is like Laurel Canyon, Stray Cat, Dinner Party, Santa Ana Wins, right? And you don't know where that's going to go. You're just like, God, there's something tender in that. There's something about that that like feels like it says something about California and me. And um, you put it away. And then one day you're like, I think that's the beginning of the book. And you tack it up and you haven't written a scene yet, but you have all of the pieces there. And so that was very helpful for this kind of writing that's based on fact, where there are certain markers to hit, like when I got kicked out of the house when I was 16 years old, when I didn't get into college, when I left New York, like whatever it is, like I would be like, okay, so here I can see the waves of story. It's like escalating action, conf conflict, descending, like over and over again. Um, so that is the sort of like logistic answer to that question that is now a very like, good now yeah I'm, now i'm, I'm off for note cards. Cards. i'm like yeah <laughs> i gotta get some note cards yes um, you do i love that well someone in the chat had asked this and then now there's a little also a question about it, so maybe i'll blend these questions i don't know who asked about it in the chat but rachel asked well said that she read strain two days last weekend um, I'm, she said she's curious about and you kind of talk about this when we were talking but all of the geography and history how all of the geography and history of California came to be such an integral part of the book and the research. Oh, and she asks, what was the research you did to find it? And somebody else also asked, what were some of the books about California that you read or used uh, to inform the writing? So great question, because no one ever asked that actually. The first part of the answer is that I was falling in love with like a kind of textbook naturalist outdoor man who was taking me around California and we were camping and like I had not been with someone who paid attention to the natural world in that way in a long time you know it, I you don't really get those types in New York City <laughs> no no you don't and, I was saying you must have really been in love if you were camping so and yeah no I He's still to this, never mind. We can talk about that later. But he's just like, where's that girl who loved to camp? I was like, she was a figment of your imagination. <laughs> um, she also was not a mom of two kids. So, um, and anyway. like, ah, the things we pretend to like in the beginning. <laughs> I know. There's also like, I jumped in the ocean in February once and like the Pacific's warm, but he still is like, you never go in the ocean anymore. I'm like, no, that wasn't, that wasn't a real thing. <laughs> um, so I'm falling in love with this man who's giving me access to California in a totally different way as a like shaped environment. And he was part of the reason I was interested in Owens Valley because he took me out there to see a piece of land art. And I was like, what happened here? Like, this is a nightmare scape that was one of the largest lakes in California and now empty a dust bed. And he knew the whole story. Like he knows history. He knows why these plants are here and when they came and whether they're invasive or native. And so part of that was falling back in love with California with someone else's lens, not just like my, like the 405 goes this way. <laughs> like, there's a story in how this city was laid out in the way Sunset Boulevard was built. There's a story in the way the San, in the different ages between the San Gabriel Mountains and the Santa Monica Mountains. And so that felt like a part of me seeing my birthplace in a new light. 
For California books, I'm obsessed with Mike Davis's City of Quartz and the Ecology of Fear. He is like a crazy radical Marxist and he, but he also has such a great lens on Los Angeles and how fucked up it is. And he has this very famous essay called Let Malibu Burn, where he is just like, we are cheating people out of money. We're giving them fire insurance so that they can build some place where their house is 100% going to burn down and we know that. Like it's all incentivized by real estate development and the people who are living in Malibu are just like, oh, it'll never, yes, thank you. Um, it'll never happen to me and it always happens because this these hills always burn. Um, this isn't new, it's been like this since, this, since before, um, before the Spanish were here. <laughs> so I love those books. And then um, Where I Was From by Joan Didion is like the driest memoir of growing up in California. And I really was like consciously working it. I was like, this is the most boring of her books. And I loved it. But <laughs> like, I really wanted to, there, it's like a textbook. I mean, it works perfectly with City of Quartz and Ecology of Fear. Hmm. Amazing. Um, I want to go read all of this. I know this reading Stray really made me want to like dig in on on California and Los Angeles because it is a place that if you're from here or if you live here, you see it through such a personal lens. And when you like pull back and really kind of, you know, see it from another person's eyes or look look at the history, it's really it's like a fascinating, weird place. Like you said, it's it's not it's not all like this Hollywood kind of glamour that I think people think of. It's, it's a weird, weird place. Yeah, it was developed. It was like a real estate scheme. The whole city, that's all it was. It was a trick to make people think they were moving to the Mediterranean and then there was no water here. Um, I stayed in New York, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have a very, oh, someone just asked a very controversial question that we all should answer. What's your favorite, jo well, it's a good one to end on because I think unfortunately we have to, we have to stop, even though there's, I'm sorry, we didn't get to everybody's question. Um, what's your favorite Joan Didion book? God. You guys are going first, obviously. I'm going to close it. Blue Nights. I mean, Blue, Blue Nights. Nights? I oh. know, it's weird. It's weird. No, no, no. Too sad. No, it's just very sad, yeah. No, it rips my heart out, but it is, I love that book. And I just need to say really quick, Kara, Kara's my best friend in case nobody knows that um and she's such my best friend that's so I haven't said like so and so's my best friend in so long it felt very like second grade in a good way but um Kara's my best friend and she's so my best friend that when blue nights before it came out they, I was like desperately wanting a copy of it and couldn't find one couldn't find one Kara got her hands on one but she was going to have to give it back. So she literally photocopied no, everything. I didn't have to give it back. I wanted to read it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, regardless, <laughs> she photocopied every single page and gave it to me for my flight back to LA from New York. Oh, I, that was the it, nicest thing anyone's done and, for me. and if you know me, you know I love like shipping and handling and stuff like that. So it really, but, but, and I also just wanted to do that for her. And and your man, I'm sorry, to say you're such a good friend and you're making this not a good friend story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I love photocopying and I kept the book for myself and I'm like, she photocopied every page before giving I it. I did. I did. I anyway, had, it was I, very I did. sweet. And so I think the, One you know, of my love languages to you though, is sending you bound manuscripts. And that's how you ended up with Stray too. Like it was so goody goody for me to goody. get Stray. And I, before self-sacrifice I was like please I was like Emma needs this book if you can send it to her printed on you know a manila envelope she'll read it so um yeah but so oh what I was gonna say is that I think the way that you're like sh given something kind of affects your feelings towards it so I think the way that she gave it to me and my experience reading Blue Nights on the plane from New York to LA and then landing and having finished it so th it's just the whole thing is my favorite but anywho Sarah, Sarah that was oh. very sweet and What's your true. favorite? And my favorite is, oh, um, my favorite is the White Album for sure. Yeah. For sure. Without a doubt. Uh, go ahead. Tell us why. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say, I, 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 the first, you know, I like, I think 
discovered Joan when I was 18 and I read Year of Magical Thinking because it came out then and I had lost my parent and, you know, I read it. And then I think anybody who really, like, I thought I was the only person who knew Joan didn't even want to know. And, um, <laughs> I think that's a phase of life that everyone goes through because I'm like, do you guys know about John Didion? And everyone's like, do you? Yeah. But it's, I mean, so, so then I read a lot of other stuff and then, yeah, the white album for me, for sure. Guys, I'm coming in hot with democracy. Okay. It, we have some wow, 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 wow. It is her novel. And Joan is one of those writers that like Susan Sontag was the same way. They wanted to be known for their novels and they, their novel reputations could never overtake their nonfiction reputations. And I think that democracy is a fucking masterpiece. It is like a Graham Green, Hemingway, Fitzgerald mashup by Hemingway, by Didion. Like I really do, I think, I think of it when I think of Gatsby. Okay. So it's just, wow. you no, know, I've never read it. I, I haven't read, read it. it. The begin. I'm just going to tell you guys the first 25 pages is so weird. It's so weird. And she's doing that thing that she does in, with play it as it lays, where it's just like sh- roving points of view. And you're just like, where are we? What's going on? This would never get published today. Good God. Like, <laughs> and then it just blasts off. I love right. that book. I'm well, going to, that's it. Next book. I'm oh, sorry. That's our next read. Go. Mm. No, I was just going to say we could do like a Joan. We could read a Joan that we didn't together. Because I was thinking the 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 loop of all the three of us being on this too is like I remember Sweet Bitter finding out about Sweet Bitter and being like you got to you. I don't know. Maybe you told me I. It was a very shared book for us. Me and That's you. All yes. Yeah. And then I was so obsessed with Stephanie. I literally. Okay. ran to book soup to get my book signed. Like I was, I was like, I would like wanted to see her talk and meet her. And I got a picture with her and I'm like, the, cute and the same haircut in the photo and we're like the same height. And it was just a really cute moment. And I was so excited to meet you and have you signed my book. Which is to say, as we end, there may be some kind of collaboration about Stray that lies beyond the page. I'll just say that. <laughs> yes, there yes. may be. Somebody was asking um, like where we have certain things set up and I, you know, we've there, there, I think, well, whatever we're, we're working on something maybe that's beyond the page. Yeah, we're working together. That too vague. <laughs> oh, that was great. That was perfect. <laughs> that was explicit. Okay. Sexually explicit. Mom, I'm on live. I'm on, I'm on a live thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm on live. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Joey just I goes think, Kelly saying like, like there's like 200 people on here. Um we th- that should end it. No. Yeah, we, that, you guys thank you so, yeah. so much. Um <laughs> Stephanie, thank you. No, you thank you both. I adore you and Amazing. this is really lovely. And thank you for everyone who showed up and, and thank you guys you Greenlight. Get, thank you to Greenlight for hosting this. And, and Greenlight, get stray, get the paperback, get the hardback, get just get it. Just read it. Um, yeah. it's amazing. Every, everyone buy a book from Greenlight. That's it doesn't have to be my book. I don't care. But they do so much hosting these events and um, support them any way yeah. you can. I'm buying some books right now when we get off from Greenlight. From, no, from Greenlight. Absolutely. Thank you so okay. much. Guys. Bye, Thank guys. you so much, everybody. What a fantastic discussion. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, don't forget to buy your copy of Stray in-store or online at greenlightbookstore.com. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night. Bye. 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 Bye.